Did you know that one of the most common problem for the A2141 16-inch MacBook Pro 2019 is the blown TPS 61AD? And this bulging faulty bug converter is so troublesome because it frequently dies and kill all the NANs by sending the 12 volt PP bus G3 hot directly to the NAND chips, causing them to explode and leaves burn mark like this one. Your data are completely gone and you can do nothing to retrieve them from these dead NANs but at least you can still restore this logic board to a functional working state so this video will show you how to repair this problem systematically. This is literally the same famous problem that Louis Rossman talked about on his YouTube channel and we believe you might get the same trouble with this TPS 621AD. So the first thing first is you have to make sure you have a dead nun to begin with. And in this case, we are pretty sure that one of the nuns dead because of this burn mark on its surface as well as the bulging sign on the TPS 61 AD. You can use any decent thermal camera like this Infiray Pro or maybe isopropyl alcohol to make sure the shot is coming from the TPS 61 AD and the dead nun. And since a single nun is dead, your customer has to accept that all of his data are gone just like how we expect explained in a previous video. So the following methods we're going to discuss today is not intended for data recovery. They're only meant to repair and resurrect the logic board with a fresh install. So to begin the repair, you need to refer to the landing pads rule and read rule number 0 that states the 500GB limit for the T2 Mac. So you need to identify what is the current SSD size for this particular logic board you have in front of you by counting the NANs on this logic board. So here on the left chicken wing, you can see there are 4 NANs soldered to the logic board and the other wing is where you can find another 2 untouched NANs. So this NAND configuration is widely known to give you a total of 1TB SSD size by combining 6 Toshiba NANDs TSB4228. Each NAND of TSB4228 has a capacity of 192GB. By knowing this fact and referring to rule number 0, having a 1TB SSD size means you have a T2 chip with 2GB of RAM that will allow you to put any SSD size on this logic board. Any size from 120GB to 8TB SSD will be compatible for this particular MLB. So that is the case if you have a 1TB SSD logic board with 6 FLP NANs like this one. But let's say if this logic board happens to have only 5 FLP NANs, 4 complete NANs on the left wing and a single NAN on the other wing. So this NAN configuration is famously known to give you a total of 500GB of SSD size by combining 5 Toshiba NANs TSB4227. If you have this 500GB SSD configuration, then it's quite unfortunate that you can only swap the NANs between 120 to 500GB range but not more than that because your logic board has a downgraded version of T2 chip with only 1GB of RAM. But this configuration is not what we will demonstrate today as we will be working on a 1TB logic board version with 6 FLP NANs. So if you translate all these values into a table, this is what you will get. You should see the 1TB SSD size or bigger capacity would require at least 2GB of T2 DRAM cache size but 500GB SSD size or smaller capacity can operate on each either 1GB or 2GB cache size. So now, knowing that you have a 1TB SSD size with 2GB T2 chip and you know this logic board can accept any NAN size, then you need to discuss with your client on how much he could afford to pay for this job. Well, maybe you need to send a complete price list that includes all the available SSD size options together with the labor charge. We're not going to discuss how much you could charge for this work. Because you know the repair and labor fees really differ from one country to another so you need to find a balance for this pricing yourself. So if your client's pockets are so strong that he wants to upgrade it to 8TB SSD size then the only available methods practically is by utilizing the Mac Pro SSD kit then you need to quote the price for the new 8TB Mac Pro SSD kit from Apple plus labor charge or maybe he just want to upgrade it to the smaller 2TB SSD size and we will cover this Mac Pro SSD in our next video. 
However, if your customer goes like, Nah, I'm just gonna give this Mac to my kid for homework purposes, you know, so 120 gigs is fine. Well, because 120 gigabyte should be the cheapest option they could have, so look at the repair options you have for 120 gigabyte SSD size. It's either you implement the direct transplant method or the JC NAND programmer. And please note that you can only get brand new NANDs by utilizing the Mac Pro SSD kit, but the other two available options at the bottom here are using old used NANDs pull off from another working system. Let's say if you want to proceed with the direct transplant method, read the next line of the landing pads rule, and by following rule number one, rule number two, Rule number 5 and number 6, you should be able to pull off the used NANDs from a donor 13-inch MacBook Pro with two FLP NANDs that resembles the 120GB SSD configuration. You can also use the NANDs from the MacBook Air 2018 by the way. Then you need to mark the respective NANDs numbering sequence 0 and 1 before pulling them off and prepare the NANDs by wicking the footprints with the soldering iron, then reball each of the NANDs with the solder paste and bring forth the dead 16-inch logic board, remove all four NANDs on the left chicken wing even though some of them might still be working and not dead yet then label each of the landing pads with the correct numbering sequence 0 1 2 and 3 and finally transplant them to the left wing of the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the correct numbering sequence you can check our previous video if you don't know how these numberings exist Next, if you don't want to remove the remaining two unused NANDs on the right wing here, you can turn off this wing functionality by removing the R5610 that will cut off the 3v3 volt supply for the Ocarina chip. And don't forget to remove the blown TPS62180 IC from the logic board and replace it with a brand new IC then solder it with the hot air gun. After reassembling everything and restoring the MacBook with the Apple Configurator 2, you will get a MacBook exactly like this one. You will have a 16-inch MacBook Pro with a beefy Core i7 or maybe i9, but when you switch to the storage tab, you will see a tiny 120GB of SSD storage, just enough to keep this MacBook running. Well, you know, just like working out so hard in the gym, but you decide to skip the leg day every day. Anyway, on the logic board, you should see a single NAND with a capacity of 64GB at the top side, and as you turn it around on the other side, you can see another 64GB NAND on the bottom side. So this is where the Intel UEFI is stored in order for your MacBook to be able to turn on or down, so when a single NAND dies, you will never see the question mark folder icon and your MacBook simply dies. So that is the case if your customer just needs a 120GB SSD size and you can use the JC programmer if you want to. Next, here's the available methods for the rest of NAND sizes and it really depends on your customer's budget. With all of that being said, actually today our client doesn't want the cheapest option because you know he's not completely broke and he goes like, I want the same top-notch 1TB storage that Apple gave me when I bought this MacBook. So look at the repair methods available for the 1TB SSD size. You can either choose Mac Pro SSD kit or the JC programmer or maybe direct transplant method from donor boards. But this time, we will complete this work and walk you through using the JC programmer. So the first thing you want to do is to remove all the dead, shorted NANDs from the logic board using the hot air and knife. We're just gonna use hot air without any nozzle and heat up the local area to prevent thermal shock before removing the NANDs with a knife at liquidest temperature. Well, if you think using knife is lame and unprofessional, you can use this special poking tool for NANDs removal and it does help you to remove the NANDs quite easily and safely. This tool is called the SEXY Blades. I'm not really sure if it should sound sexy though, maybe they're out of cool names. Anyway, this tool would be really useful later on to remove the remaining blades black epoxy underfill around the landing pads. After prying off all the NANDs from the logic board using the sexy tool, just proceed to clean and remove all epoxy on the top left wing, bottom left wing, bottom right wing, and finally the top right wing. You need to prepare all the 6 NAND functional landing pads even though some technicians are lazy to remove them and it is compulsory to remove the epoxy around the resistors and capacitors because if you look at them carefully, you can see solder blobs spitting from the sides of the capacitors and resistors that resulted from 
saw the expansion when you removed the nans just now. You can imagine from a cross-section view of this particular capacitor perfectly soldered onto the main logic board from the factory, then surrounded by this annoying black epoxy. And as you apply the heat to the nans and the local area, and when the solder expand and it doesn't have enough space to move underneath the epoxy, it ended burst to the sides of the caps. As a result, this component will look like it's floating on the logic board surface and leaving the gap between the contact surfaces. And this problem that looks negligible to some people will cause various random errors in Apple Configurator too. So even though this process is tedious and time-consuming, you must carefully remove the surrounding epoxy no matter what. And during this process, there's always a risk of losing components flying to the infinite space as you'll never find them again and you must restore them by pulling the components from the donor logic board. And sometimes, if you messed up and accidentally cut the copper traces like this one, you don't need to freak out and say, Oh no, you scratch and hurt my logic board. Well, it's not the end of the world yet, and you can just reconnect them again and cover it with the conformal coating. Next, you can clean the landing pad surface by wicking them with the soldering iron and wick and wipe all the messy flux residue with alcohol. So after all the NAND landing pads have been cleaned and ready to accept another donor NANDs, we're gonna go ahead and proceed to the next step. Next, plug the USB cable to the JCP13 programmer, then enter the user interface and navigate to Mac options and choose MacBook Pro. Next, on the right side of the UI, choose the option for A2141 16-inch MacBook Pro and it will show you the option for the 500GB SSD as well as the 1TB option. Choose the 1TB configuration and you should see the NANs you have to find from any of your donor logic boards. So as you can see here, this 1TB configuration utilizes 6 Toshiba TSB4228 NANs so you need to scavenge the 6 Toshiba NANs from any other MacBook Pro or maybe iMac or anywhere you can find them. In this case, we would be pulling two NANs TSB4228 from a MacBook Pro 2020 with a dead CPU and another two NANs TSB4228 from the iCloud locked iMac 2020 and guess what? The final two NANs are the ones pulled out from the right wing we were working on just now. These NANs are basically untouched and still can be used because they're not exploded like the ones on the left chicken wing. Next, you must carefully remove all of the target NANs gently from the donor logic boards and don't apply excessive heat to the NANs and they all should be handled with care. So gather all of the 6 TSB4228 NANs then use the BGA reballing jig to grip the NAN and start to clean them one by one too. Use the same sexy tool to carefully remove the excess black epoxy to prevent contact errors while using the JC programmer later on. Then apply solder flux Remove the lead-free solder with solder wick and soldering iron to flatten the surface and repeat it for the second nan, third nan, fourth nan and finish it until the end. Next, after all the 6 Toshiba nans have been cleaned with alcohol, they're now ready to be flashed with the JCP13 programmer. But before we proceed any further to discuss the next step, we need to highlight this one specific part in the JC user interface that is related to how the nans are labeled on this program. So these numberings are known as reference designators. Well, it might sound complicated to the end user, but actually that's what Apple called them. So these designators are used to locate each individual nans on the actual logic board hardware, as you can see in the board view for this particular 16-inch logic board that reference U8700 on the top right wing, then reference U92 and U9300 are located on the top left chicken wing and so forth. But somehow, we will not be using these designators in our workflow today because of some reasons we will explain at the end of this video. So instead, we will be using the NAND sequence to organize our NANDs by translating each individual designators to their respective port and order. So open the board view for the 16-inch logic board, then find the U8700 on the top right wing, then look at the pin 87 that reads SSD1 clock request 1 that tells you it's a NAND on the 01 port with the first order. Next. Find the U9200 on the top left wing and look at the pin number 87 that reads SSD0 clock request 1 that tells you it's a NAND on the 00 port with the first order. Then repeat the same steps for U9300 and you will find out that it is a NAND on the 00 port with the second order. Next, 
you will find out that U9100 is a NAND on the 00, zero port with the 0th order, then U9400 is the NAND on the 00, zero port with the 3rd order, and finally the U8600 is located on the bottom right wing that tells you it's a NAND on the 0, 01 port with the 0th order. It's completely fine if you don't understand the reasons behind all of this because we will explain it again later. So now you are ready for the next step, so just take any NAND to begin with, insert it to the NAND socket and close the cover. You you should see the P13 automatically read the NAND model, make sure it's the right model TSB4228 and the user interface software will also show you the NAND configuration you can have. Well, just select the 1 terabyte configuration just now and begin to flash it with the first U8700 at the top here. Just click write JC data and it will begin to program the U8700 NAN. When it finally says NAN repair completed, you can open the cover and we will start to label it as 01 port with the first order. So we have successfully programmed a single NAND, then take it out and put it on the right side and simply take any NAND on the left to program next. If you look at the UI, you can see the U8700 turns to blue, so we will proceed to program the next NAND by clicking right JC data for the U9200. Wait until it says NAND repair completed and then you can safely open the NAND cover and label it as 00 port with the first order. Take it out and put it on the right side and now we have two reprogrammed NANDs. Then put the next NAND into the socket and this time you will see U9200 also turn to blue and repeat the same steps again for U9300. Open the NAND cover, label it as 00 port with the second order. Next, put the other NAND into the socket and this time you will see U9300 also turn to blue and repeat the same redundant steps again for U9100. Well, don't get tired just yet. Open the NAND cover and label it as 00 port with the 0th order. And again, put another NAND into the socket and then you will see U9100 also turn to blue and repeat the same steps again for U9400. Open the NAND cover and label it as 00 port with the 3rd order. And finally, put the last NAND into the socket and you should see all of them turn to blue except the U8600. So program the NAND for the last time on the list. Open the cover and label it as 01 port with the 0th order. So right now, we have successfully reprogrammed all 6 NANDs and this is a little bit comparison between before and after reprogramming the NANDs. So on the left side, before you reprogramming them, you can pretty much say that the NANDs have a different firmware colors because obviously they were pulled out from various donor boards like the iMac 2020, 13 inch MacBook Pro as well as 16 inch MacBook Pro. So this NAND's combination will never work in a MacBook until you reprogram each individual NAND firmware to the same blue color like what you see on the right side. So they're all ready to be soldered to the logic board again. So we will begin to prepare the NANDs for the next step, that is reballing solder balls to their footprint. Use the same BGA reballing jig to hold the NAND firmly, then overlay the BGA 110 stencil on the footprint and make sure it is properly aligned with the pads and only then you can begin to apply the solder paste to fill in the BGA footprint. We're just using the cheap mechanic solder paste like this one bought from China. Next, remove the excess solder paste to prevent solder blob that would possibly cause uneven balls. Then. Hold the stencil down firmly with the tweezers and begin to locally heat them until they turn to shiny solder balls. Next, carefully remove the stencil and give it a little bit of reflow to let the surface tension do the work. So you have successfully reball a single NAN. Then proceed to reball the next NAN with the same steps. So this is the second NAN, the third NAN, the fourth NAN, the fifth NAN, and finally the sixth NAN. After you finish reballing all of them, bring forth the set 16 inch logic board into the scene and we'll start to focus on the top side first and go for the left chicken wing, then solder the NANDs to the two functional landing pads here. Apply solder flux to the two FLPs and pick the correct NAND for each landing pad. By referring to the board view, the lower NAND pad belongs to the 00 port with the first order, so make sure to pick the NAND with the 00 1 marking and place it on the lower FLP with the correct orientation. Just put it there first and we will precisely align it again later. Next, 
The board view shows that the upper NAN pad belongs to the 00 port with the second order. So make sure to pick the NAN with the 00-2 marking and place it on the upper FLP with the correct orientation. Then you can finally align them precisely under the microscope. After aligning them to the landing pads, you can take any metal cover or in this case, we use these blades to cover the CD3217 ICs as well as to prevent hot air from melting the FPC connectors. Then you can begin to direct the heat to the local area back and forth until you see the NANs actually fall down and move into place. So the top left wing is done and secured, let's move on to the top right wing. This time, the board view tells you that the lower NAN pad belongs to the 01 port with the first order, so make sure to pick the NAN with the 01-1 marking and place it on the only FLP with the correct orientation. We can now align the NAN using the microscope and put the blade on top of those FPC connectors to protect them from heat and begin to reflow the NAN until it falls down and sits into place. After it finally cools down, flip the logic board to the bottom side and we will take care of the bottom right wing. And the board view tells you that the upper landing pad is actually belongs to the 01 port with the 0th order. So make sure to pick the correct NAN with the 01-0 marking, align the NAN position with the microscope, then cover the critical CD3217 from unnecessary heat and you can begin to heat the area with the hot air gun until it solders into place. Next. We will proceed to the bottom left wing and you can find two FLPs on this side. The board view shows you that the upper NAN pad is for the 00 port with the 0th order and the lower NAN pad is for the 00 port with the 3rd order. So take the remaining two NANs, then place them to their respective positions and make sure the orientation is correct. Align the NANs with the help of a microscope and begin to heat them until they solder into place. Next. We will restore the missing TPS6180 here, so under the microscope, you need to apply the solder flux and align the new IC, then reflow the IC while holding it with the tweezers. And that's it folks, we're finally done with all the soldering steps. So one way to quickly know if you're on the right track is to install the USB-C flex cable, then plug in the USB-C charger to any of these two ports. Next, take the multimeter, put the black probe on the ground and the red probe to any non-power rails like PP2V5 and measure the 2.5 volt past the 30 seconds mark. So if the voltage is stable all the time and does not fluctuate to zero volt, then it's a good sign that the logic board successfully enters the recovery mode. Next, right now we have this logic board ready for DFU or restore process but it requires a secondary MacBook as a host and usually you can just reassemble this target logic board into the chassis again but for this video we just want to prove to you that the only thing required for a successful DFU restore process is the trackpad cable. This is true for any T2 MacBooks. So we will plug in only the trackpad cable to the logic board and you need to connect USB-C charger on the first USB-C port and then another USB-C cable connecting the host and the target. You can use any ports on the host Mac, but the target Mac must be plugged into the second USB-C port that functions as DFU port. So on the host Mac, you should see the Apple Configurator 2 automatically enters into recovery mode. Right click on the recovery logo and choose restore and it will wipe all the previous data on the NANs and download the Intel UFI directly from the Apple server and transfer it through the SBC cable to the T2 chip and finally into the NANs again. The whole thing is being done while you see this progress bar completing the restore process. Well, actually, it's not the only Intel UFI that is being restored. There's a lot more involved like the Bridge OS and things like Secure Enclave, etc. But let's not make things too complicated for now, okay? So in real time, it does take around 5 minutes to complete the restore process before showing you the padlock logo. And when it does, you can pretty much say the T2 circuits including the NANs are working fine now. Or maybe you want to say the integrated iPhone circuit is all working now, so let's figure out if the rest of Intel circuitries are also going to work. Reassemble the logic board into the chassis and you should see the NANs are still intact and both of the fans spinning, then the LCD shows you the boot option for the internet recovery. Just enter the Wi-Fi password and follow the next instructions just like how you usually install the macOS. After going through the formatting process and successfully installing the macOS Ventura, you can install the DriveDX apps and view the general TBW stats regarding the NANs you've soldered. If you open about this Mac, this is a 16-inch MacBook Pro 2019 
with Intel Core i9 and then click more info, scroll down to the end will show you the total SSD capacity of soldered and that is 1TB. So that's it folks, we have successfully fixed a 16-inch Intel MacBook Pro with that SSD issue. <laughs> But do not close and run away from this video just yet and let's have a little bit of analysis on what's going on. Let us consider this typical T2 block diagram for any T2 Mac and the first 4 landing pads at the top here belong to the 00 port and the rest 4 landing pads belong to the 01 port. So when you use the JC NAND programmer in your workflow, you simply create and program the NAND sequence for the T2 chip. Then, as you recall the reference designators that Apple used to label all the NANDs and try to rearrange them to this block diagram, this is what you will see. So you should see all the NANDs with U9000 designators are located on the 00 port and the rest of NANDs with U8000 designators are located on the 01 port. This is the case when you reprogram all the NANDs using the 16-inch NAND configuration and you choose not to translate each of them to their respective NAND sequence. If you still insisted to label the NANDs according to the Apple's designators, you know what? It will work just fine. But we will show you how it can be a problem. Let's say if you want fix another A2141 16-inch logic board with that SSD issue so you can just transplant each NAND from the JC programmer to the target 16-inch logic board without any confusion like U8700 to U8700 then U9300 to U9300 and finish it until the end and it will work just fine. But things will get complicated and you will start to have a problem when you want to fix any other T2 Mac with that SSD issue like this A1990 15-inch MacBook Pro logic board with the same blown TPS 6180. But some things are a lot different now as you can see, all the NANDs with U9000 designators are now located on the 01 port not 00 port anymore. And then, all the NANDs with U8000 designators are now located on the 00 port not 01 anymore. So these ports arrangement are completely inverted when you compare the 16-inch and 15-inch logic board and things get really confusing when you blindly follow these designators numberings for transplanting the NANDs and this is what you will end up with. So this NAND arrangement will never work since you leave empty spaces on the 00 port that directly violate rule number 5 of the landing pads rule that states the requirement to stuff the NANDs on the 00 port first followed by the 01 port and you've probably messed up the NAND sequence too. And of course, this mistake will cost you a lot of random errors in the Apple configurator too. So the only way to effectively avoid this mistake is to not use the reference designators in your workflow especially when working with different T2 Macs and translate each individual NAND to their respective NAND sequence 0, 1, 2 and 3 by referring the board view and finally solder the NANDs to their respective sequence and it will work just fine. This is the perfect example for this topic. This is the A1990 MacBook Pro 15-inch 2018 with Intel Core i9 and when you switch to the storage tab, you can see a total of 1TB SSD capacity that we've soldered. So let's zoom out a little bit and we will show you how the logic board looks like. So you can see how the NANDs are soldered to the logic board and this NAND configuration that combines 6 Toshiba TSB4228 is actually meant only for 16-inch logic board but right now we are using it for the 15-inch MacBook model. So these are the NAND sequence for this particular logic board and you should stuff the NANDs on the right wing first because that's where the 00 port is. Unlike the 16-inch logic board, the 00 port is now located on the other side so you should stuff the NANDs on the left chicken wing first. Another reason why we refuse to use the reference designators is simply because this SSD kit for the iMac Pro and Mac Pro 2019 has no documentation, no board views, no schematics, nothing. So we can only rely on the NAND sequence to fix these two Macs. We will discuss more about this SSD kit in a future video. With all of that being said, all the NAND configurations you can see in the JC programmer are all compatible to each other as long as they obey the landing pads rule. Meaning that you can take the NAND configuration from the MacBook Air and use it in the MacBook Pro or maybe MacBook Pro to the Mac Mini or maybe Mac Mini to the iMac Pro as long as they obey the landing pads rule. 
To prove what we explained, we've repeated the experiment with the iMac Pro we have and another one is the 15-inch MacBook Pro 2019. Both of these machines are having the NANs duplicated using the JC programmer but this time we only soldered 250GB instead of 1TB. This Toshiba NAN configuration was copied and duplicated from the files of the JC programmer by selecting the 13-inch MacBook Pro 2019 setting. So first, we will proceed to solder the NANs to the iMac Pro. Then, we find another set of identical NANs and reprogram all of them, then solder the NANs to the 15-inch MacBook Pro 2019. So that's how we created the storage size for these two Macs. As we zoom in, you can see the iMac Pro is running on macOS High Sierra 10.13 while the MacBook Pro is running on macOS Mojave 10.14. And then, you should see the SSD's lifetime on both of the machines are still 100% but as you look at the SSD serial number on both machines, you will find that they're not the same even though you were duplicating the same NAND firmware from the JC programmer because just like what we explained, the SSD serial number for T2 Macs are tied to the T2 chip not stored in the NAND firmware. Next, you can see the firmware version is also different because obviously the iMac Pro is on the older version High Sierra and the MacBook is on the later version of Mojave. Next, the power run time and power cycle count are the same on both machines because these values were duplicated from the NANs in the JC programmer and finally the data units written or TBW even though they're not having the same value but you can tell that they actually start from the same number and they slightly differ by a tiny 2GB size because you can say the Mojave installer simply has a larger size than High Sierra. So it's pretty legitimate value to me. And if you wondered how the NANs look like on both of the machines, well obviously on the iMac Pro, you just need to stuff the 00 port on the right physical connector and you can just pull it off from the system. We're gonna put it side by side with the 15-inch MacBook Pro just now and you should see two NANs were soldered to the top side and flipping them to the other side will show you the other two NANs. So that's all what we have today folks and I hope this video will help you to solve this dreaded SSD problem and maybe make some money from it. Leave us some comments down below, hit the like and subscribe button and see you again at iBoff RCC channel, reverse engineering at its best. Have a nice day and thanks for watching.